Hello. Welcome to Wednesday afternoon. Welcome to Archival Adventures here at uh, VTUL Studios channel. Um, I am simul streaming on uh, my personal channel, Rogan27. So whether you're here on VTUL Studios or on my personal channel, uh, welcome in. Um, if you are not currently following the VTUL Studios channel, please do so. Uh, it is twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios. Um, we have a variety of content on the channel, including uh, a live play uh, tabletop RPG uh, program called Roll of Play that airs on Fridays. Uh, but this is Wednesday, and on Wednesday, we have Archival Adventures. Um, and uh, I see Adventures of Tony. Um, welcome, hello. And also Wraith Fay. Uh, welcome. I see you on the VTUL Studios page, and I see that you dropped some wonderful, wonderful bits. Um, corgi bits on my channel, so thank you very much for that. Um, I uh, do want to open the show as I um, have started doing uh, and will be doing going forward with um, a couple of acknowledgments. So um, we acknowledge the Tutelo and Monacan people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and air that Virginia Tech consumes. We pay respect to the Tutelo and Monacan nations and to their elders past, present, and emerging. We also acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Smithfield Plantation. At any point from 1774 to 1865, the Preston family enslaved 40 to 100 African men, women, and children on this land. We pay respect to the, those souls and acknowledge that Virginia Tech is undeniably tied to this legacy. Further, we acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Solitude Estate, which enslaved at least 30 African men, women, and children on this land. We acknowledge the contributions of the Fraction family and other enslaved persons in the creation and emergence of Virginia Tech as a major land-grant university. In accordance with the university's efforts to transform an historic location into a site for the interpretation of African American experience on campus and in the region. So, today, we will be, uh, <laughs> uh, Pacatl, thank you for the stretch redemption. I will stretch. Um, today we're looking at the Gary Ann Giovanni uh, culinary papers. Um, and so I will lose sight of uh, chat on one of my channels for a little bit because I'm going to um, be in a different tab. Uh, <laughs> while we look at the uh, finding aid for these papers so that we can get a sense of who Gary Giovanni er, is, <laughs> I almost said was, is, um, because I know nothing about this collection. So um, right now I just have the chat from VTUL Studios available for me to see. Uh, I will see the chat from uh, the other channel in a little bit. Uh, <laughs> still new to, to running this on two channels, and we will see uh, how that progresses going forward. But um, the Gary Ann Giovanni culinary, culinary Papers, uh, 1997 to 2004. Uh, so that's the time range that the papers themselves cover. Um, 3.5 cubic feet in three boxes. And the abstract, so brief general description, papers of Gary Ann Giovanni, a chef, caterer, and cooking teacher active in Blacksburg, Virginia. The collection contains records, menus, and recipes from her catering jobs and from the cooking classes she taught for the local YMCA Open University. Also includes material related to the various community organizations for which Gary worked or volunteered, and some material associated with her sister, poet Nikki, Gio Nikki Giovanni. Um, so already a little bit of biographical information just in the abstract there. <laughs> uh, Tony, I'm, I'm happy to convey those words and I really do um, think that they're important to include. Um, I've been doing the land acknowledgement uh, for a number of years at all of the events that I've done here on campus. Um, the specific land acknowledgements related to the former slavery on this site um, is something newer, but 
the first time that I heard someone do it, I thought it was very important to continue. Um, so I've incorporated it. Oh, no, no. Uh, Tony, part of this show is the interaction with the chat. Um, so I'm happy that you brought it up. Um, I'm just going to set these here so that we can have something in the little uh, upper box while looking at the finding aid. Because um, otherwise it's just a blank piece of table and I don't think that's as interesting to look at. Um, <laughs> and then we'll actually look at this item uh, once I finish with the finding aid here. Um, so there's a little biographical information here. I think it's very important to know a little bit about the person whose papers these are. Um, and so the, the biographical information included in our finding aids was either supplied with the collection um, or researched by one of our archivists or one of our students um, so that we could give a brief biographical sketch of the person so that a researcher would get a sense of where the person was coming from when they created or collected these materials. So Gary Ann Giovanni was born in September 1940 in Knoxville, Tennessee, and attended Central State University in Ohio. She married young, divorced, and then married Joe Black, the first African American to pitch in a World Series, and had one son with him. In 1973, Giovanni graduated from Xavier University in Cincinnati, Ohio. Giovanni volunteered with Fannie Lou Hamer in delivering Christmas turkeys in Mississippi during the Civil Rights Movement. She attended the California Culinary Academy, studying with master pastry chef Bo Freiberg, as well as with pastry chef Jim Dodge at the Stanford Court Hotel, chef Herbert Keller of Fleur de Lis, and many others. For five years, Giovanni owned and ran a full-service catering business in Oakland, California. Giovanni worked for Sealand Corporation in Oakland, California until 1994 when she retired and moved with her mother to Blacksburg, Virginia, where her sister, poet Nikki, Giov Nikki Giovanni, lives. While in Blacksburg, Giovanni opened a catering business with Rebecca Eisenhower, which they named B-I-G-G, the acronym representing both of their initials. At the same time, Giovanni taught numerous well-received classes throughout the YMCA's Open University program. She studied at several of the Greenbrier's cooking workshops. In 2005, Giovanni was diagnosed with a brain tumor. She died that August in Blacksburg, Virginia. The majority of the collection contains detailed information about the various catering jobs that, uh, and Open U YMCA classes that uh, Gary Ann Giovanni handled during her 10 years in Blacksburg, Virginia. There is some material related to her sister, Nikki, uh, most related to various speaking activities or awards. Other items of interest include printed menus and recipes from Giovanni's attendance at the Greenbrier's Cooking School, as well as food-related ephemera, pamphlets, and other media produced by various food companies or publishers. So, uh, the way that we've been doing these is we've been just kind of pulling out any folders that the titles seem interesting. Um, but as in the past, if there is a specific folder in the finding aid that you would like to see, uh, please do let me know. Um, I'm going to copy the link here. Um, let me just switch the view back real quick to the face cam. Um, and I will post this link in both of the chats here. Uh, um, Tony, if you were to redeem a hat trick, I wouldn't be able to do it. I don't have any extra hats here, and I would have to do it on my next stream at home. So it's not mean. It's just you wouldn't get uh, you wouldn't get it done at the moment. Um, I should really make sure I have these links available before I go live. Um, one second while I type. Oh. Text. 
F. I wish I had done this earlier. <laughs> uh, L, B, V. Two, one, nine. There. Uh, so if you do want to take a look at the finding aid and look at the contents list, if there's anything listed there that you would like me to make sure I include in the program today, please note in the chat and I will make sure that we look at that folder. Otherwise, we will just look at things that I pull out that I think seem interesting. Um, the first item that we have, the item that I had on the small camera, uh, let me just flip over to the document focus here so that I am smaller and the items are bigger. Um, this item appears to be a menu. Um, this is from the series Professional, Activi uh, Professional Activities Culinary, uh, Greenbrier Menus, June 2001, 2002, and 2003. This is box one, folder 14. Um, which was laid in the box differently. I had to move it off the top to be able to get to the other folders, which is why it's the first one that I pulled. Because um, these are slightly larger items. So it, it appears to just, it, it's a menu and there's a dessert menu attached. Um, this one is Saturday, June 8th, 2003. I don't know. I think you should be able to see down toward the bottom there where that date is. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit so that I can go as close as possible without really cutting any off of the information off. Um, and so this is a, a 2003 menu from the Greenbrier. So not that long ago, um, dinner at the Greenbrier, appetizers, vichyssoise with crab meat, lobster bisque, fennel chantilly, duck consomme, fresh fruit plate with mango and basil sauce, Greenbrier pate, celeriac and walnut salad. I don't know what celeriac is. If somebody knows, I would very much appreciate you letting me know. Also. Do let me know. I think that the captions should be working on both pages, but they're not displaying for me on the VTUL Studios one. So let me know if they are not working, please. Um, oh, I think our channel displays them down below. So that's why they're not showing for me. Um, but uh, still, let me know if they're not working. <laughs> Thanks, Alice. Um, Celeriac and walnut salad, Cumberland sauce, poached pears, chilled shrimp cocktail. So I'm very curious, what is celeriac? Uh, Picadal, you're saying you believe it's an herb? I'm gonna Google it because I have that ability here. Um, celeriac, celery of a variety that forms a large swollen root that can be eaten cooked or raw. So it's just a different kind of celery, apparently. Also called celery root, or knob celery, and turnip root rooted celery. A variety of celery cultivated for its edible stem and shoots. Interesting. <laughs> High key squared, yeah, it's celery root. Um, mountain smoked trout, apple horseradish dressing, Scallop and crab green curry in puff pastry. So those are some fancy appetizers. But again, this is the green briar, um, which if you're not familiar, let me pull that up. So the green briar that we're referring to believe is the West Virginia Resort. Let me just double check here in the finding aid.
it would help if I spell. Um, yes, so Greenbrier, spelled with an E, cooking school. Pulling it up. Yes. So it is the um, the resort in West Virginia. <laughs> so that is um, it, why why these dishes are so fancy because it is it's a rather fancy, expensive resort. Um, Picado, you've never used it. And you were a line, well, I wouldn't say just. You say, your comment says, I was just a line cook for about 30 years. You were a line cook for 30 years. That's a big deal. Celery salad with garlic crouton and as Asiago cheese for, for, these are the salads, or baby spinach salad with marinated olives, feta cheese, oven roasted tomatoes, basil, and white balsamic vinaigrette or fresh baby spinach and frise salad, often uh, oven, <laughs> oven roasted tomatoes, light sweet basil and balsamic vinaigrette. I almost said often roasted tomatoes. Um, for entrees at this dinner, they have pan seared, farm raised West Virginia char, asparagus cream sauce, medley of cauliflower truffled potatoes. Sauteed potato crusted snapper on a bed of creamed fresh spinach with white asparagus and lobster sauce. Pan roasted duck breast with malt, sh malt sugar glaze, crispy soba noodles, baby bok choy, and sesame ginger sauce. Roast tenderloin of beef, chasseur sauce, fresh asparagus, truffled whipped potatoes. Uh, veal tenderloin wrapped with crispy pancetta and basil. Uh, Madeira barley jus, pan fried sweetbreads, ricotoni filled with braised short ribs, and Napoleon of wild mushrooms and chev cheese, yellow tomato coulis. That's the vegetable entree. So that would be vegetarian, but not vegan. Um, wild mushrooms sounds really good, actually. Uh, they have a pan seared George's Bank sea scallops, saffron, and black pepper fettuccine with squash and crab meat in a cipino broth. And then, let's see, the Greenbrier Spa Cuisine offerings are designed to provide a healthy balance of reduced fat and nutritionally beneficial ingredients in keeping with a healthy living program. And they ask that you not use cell phones in the dining room. So the dessert menu that was attached to this one is also somewhat extensive. There's, they have a, a sampling of dessert wines here. Quadi, uh, Quadi, Essencia, Orange Muscat, uh, same brand Elysium Black Muscat, Arrow, Arrowwood Light Harvest Riesling, Joseph Phelps. Uh, Icereba, Napa Valley. I don't know how to pronounce all of these. I don't drink a lot of wine personally. Uh, Capitelli and Selmi, Montfort, Italy. And then they have some ports, Madeira and Sherry. I'm just not gonna read all of them. Special after dinner cordials. And Greenbrier coffees and teas. But the desserts, this is what I'm most interested in from the dessert menu. <laughs> now you know where to look next time you need to name a, a lot of snobbish elves for a game. <laughs> that's good, that's good. Uh, Picadle, thank you for the hydrate. I will have a sip of water back away from the materials first. <clears throat> so they have a Greenbrier fudge cake with milk chocolate sauce. Tropical lime tart with raspberry sorbet, hazelnut espresso parfait in Kahlua sauce, baked Alaska with the three berry medley, 
I've had baked Alaska once. It was very, very sweet. Uh, Greenbrier bread pudding in vanilla sauce. Famous Greenbrier freestone peaches in whipped sweet cream. Toasted coconut pound cake with vanilla ice cream and chocolate fudge sauce. And then they have a section called Greenbrier Gourmet Ice Creams and Sorbet. And they have strawberry, vanilla bean, chocolate coffee, mocha chocolate chip, rum raisin, caramelized pecan and cream, double black raspberry, a fat-free and sugar-free vanilla, black raspberry sorbet, lemon sorbet, and greenbrier peach sorbet. And on the dessert menu, they also have cheeses. An Iowa Maytag Blue, a Swiss Gruyere, a New York Cheddar, a West Virginia uh, Briar, oh, West Virginia Briar Run Chev, Italian Bel, Bel, Bel Peas? I'm not sure how to say that one. French Camembert, Danish Blue Saga, and Danish Havarti. So, 2003 from the Greenbrier in White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia. I like that they do, um, I mean, so they have the dessert wines listed, but they also had, a, like, Americans, I'd say, don't necessarily think of dessert as the cheese course, but oftentimes dessert does include cheese. Um, and so having a completely separate section for cheese in the on the dessert menu is pretty neat. I'm not going to read all of the menus. There are quite a few of these Dinner at the Greenbrier menus in here. Um, and so Gary Giovanni attended the cooking school, like attended classes through their cooking school at the Greenbrier and would have learned how to make these types of things, which is why all of these menus are here. I, I imagine that these are probably menus from the time when uh, she was actually cooking in the kitchen there um, as part of that experience. I'm looking to see what else is in here. Greenbrier Magazine. So these are just, this folder's as labeled a collection of menus from the Greenbrier. Uh, let me pull out, see what else I've got here in box one. You've had some really good chefs from West Virginia, though not that one. I really enjoy a good cheese, um, as long as it's not a blue cheese. I'm not, not really a big fan of blue cheese. Um, so whenever I get the chance to f try some fancy, fancy cheeses, I really get excited by that. <laughs> Writings, letters, and articles. Desk calendar. Stuff on her sister, nephew, other family stuff. Ooh, professional activities catering. I'm gonna pull these two. Uh oh, you spy metal? Oh, in the collection. Yes. Kira, there are metal paper clips in the collection. I take it they were supposed to have been removed? <laughs> there, there's another one right here. N depending on how they're coded, they may not rust immediately, and we probably have time, but yeah, there's, there's paper clips. So this folder, I should show you, this is uh, folder number, or this is box one folder number one, um, <coughs> which is labeled Gary Bio, and writings, letters, articles. The first item in here is a little promo card 
Barnes & Noble presents the Gourmet Scholar Book Group. Join amateur chef Gary Giovanni for a new cookbook selection each quarter, June, September, December, March, with a discussion of the book and samples of a recipe. Gary teaches regular cooking classes at the Blacksburg YMCA, is a member of a private gourmet dinner club, and part-time bookseller at Barnes & Noble. And this is for the Barnes & Noble in Christiansburg, Virginia. Now, gives a date of sa Sunday, June 29th at 3 p.m., but we don't know what year because it doesn't include a year. This is actually one of the things, I, I should leave it there while I, while I go on a, a slight little um, commentary on documents. It is utterly surprising to me and something that I never noticed before I started doing archival work, but event flyers almost never say what year. They include the day of the week, the month, and the day, but they don't say what year. And for historical purposes and researching things about the history, that's not helpful. <laughs> like, for finding the event for somebody who's planning to attend an event that's happening in two weeks, they don't need to know the year. They just need to know the month and the day and what day of the week. And, and so that's what gets included. But it wouldn't take that much more just to include the year. And then it becomes much more useful for historians that are researching what people did. So here, we know Gary Giovanni was uh, basically giving running a cookbook club at the Barnes and Noble, and it included serving some food and things like that, but we don't know when. We know it happened Sunday, June 29th, but we don't know what year because that wasn't included on the event advertisement. And something that I never noticed until I started working in archives now we can narrow it down based on what we know about her and when she was active in the area, working with the YMCA uh, cooking class. Um, but yeah, he squared, that was driving me batty today. I was putting together an event flyers gallery for a faculty profile and none of them say when they were. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But the designer says adding that extra few characters to the date line would have meant going down to one smaller font size, which is an accessibility issue when it's posted on a bulletin board. That is also true. Um, but it, it all depends on how you design the event flyer. You can design a flyer that will include all of the information and still meet accessibility requirements. It just may require a slight change in how you approach the design. Um, but yeah, it's something that I think about now when I'm doing event flyers and, and I just automatically include the year in, in the date. So here we have a current events page. I don't know what paper this is from. Ah. So this is the New River Valley section of the Roanoke Times from Sunday, March 21st, 1999. And there's an article here paired with the picture, or there's a, uh, I don't know if I'd call it an article. There's information here paired with the picture. Um, Gary Giovanni shared some of her bread making secrets with fellow cook Sandy Bosworth during a YMCA Open University cooking class last year. Join Giovanni this spring as she teaches a wide range of classes from an idea filled Easter brunch menu to Cuisinart bread recipes, Thai cooking and low calorie summer dishes. Open University spring registration for leisure time enrichment and skill classes for all ages begins this week. So here we actually get uh, a picture that includes Gary Giovanni. Um, I believe that is Gary Giovanni on the left. And then Sandy Bosworth is the person on the right. Um, I'm guessing that just based on I know what her sister Nikki looks like. And so I'm based 
on my knowledge of that familial resemblance, I believe the person on the left is Gary Giovanni. But Kira may know for sure. <laughs> Let's see. There's a letter here from 1998 to a vendor, it appears. So again, this is writings, letters, and articles. And they're definitely I mean, th this is what what was in the papers. Um, if you think about your own personal papers and what people might find in there if they were getting them, even if you organize them into like business records or things like that, um, you'll come across things like this, most likely. Uh, if you're of an age where they're going to be paper records, or they might find something like this as an email in your records today, but we have a letter here from June 11th, 1998, addressed to Rainbow Vacuum Cleaners, 205 West Main Street, Christiansburg, Virginia. Gentlemen, recently I was called and informed that my name had been drawn through the recent home show and that I had won a set of Gensu knives. I was further informed that a demonstration of your vacuum cleaner would be given when the knives were delivered. Though no one asked if I was in the market for a vacuum cleaner, I foolishly set a time when a salesman could come over. The first date was June 9th at 2. He called at 2.10, stating that he was running late, and I informed him that I had another appointment at 3, and we set another date. He came to my house subsequently. I came up to find him sitting in my 80-year-old mother's chair, which is a special chair, and she has a curvature of the spine and cannot sit in straight-back chairs. I found him to be rather aggressive and blunt, perhaps admirable traits in salespersons, but offensive to the public in general. He asked if I was familiar with the rainbow, to which I had replied no. He asked what kind of vacuum cleaner we had, which I answered. He asked if we were interested in purchasing a vacuum cleaner, and I told him no. He asked if we had allergies, and I told him no. He went back to my interest in vacuum cleaners, and I told him that I don't even clean my own house, so the one we have is just fine. He then replied that he did not set up these appointments, and if I was not interested, he would get out of my hair, and he just walked out. This seems to be a terrible way to build business and goodwill. Everyone knows that cold calling is difficult, but it should not be done by telling someone that they have won something to get into their home. I feel deceived and annoyed and do not have a good feeling about your product. If I were to buy a vacuum cleaner, it would not be a rainbow. If your salesperson's attitude is indicative of your company policy, no doubt this letter will be ignored. However, I felt the need to let you know how I felt about what happened. Sincerely, Gary Giovanni. So, a, a letter of complaint to a local business about their salesperson's behavior. Um, this is, again, from 1998. I have no idea whether there is a rainbow vacuum cleaner dealer in the area. I don't know if they do cold calling. I don't know if there's anything like that. Um, I don't know if their sales policies would be the same today as they were in 1998. Uh, but it's an interesting look into the mindset of the person whose papers these are. Um, she cared enough to provide feedback, um, expressing her upset with the way that the interaction went um, and letting the company know that it had not gone well. Uh, and ultimately, it, it, reading that letter, it seems like the intent was to provide constructive feedback that they could use to better their operations and build their business better. Let's see. I don't know what this is, so let's look at it. <laughs> Here I am, like, previewing them. No, I'm just going to throw it on there. We'll look at it together. I don't know what it is. Uh, and we will discover together. Oh no, I missed comments. Um, 
Horrible vacuum cleaners by Kirby. Tell them Miss Gary, <laughs> tell them Miss Gary Ann, a good friend of yours got sucked up into rainbow stuff and a lot of MLM stuff. <laughs> yes, this is very early 90s printing here. Uh, let me zoom out a little bit and I think I can get the entire thing on camera. Um, 100 chefs for the Junior Center for Arts and Science? I, Junior Center of Art and Sciences. Um, I did pretty good considering how badly the ink has uh, transferred here. Um, March 15, 1992. So you're spot on with your dating there, uh, Key Squared. This is from March of 1992. Printed generously, uh, printing generously donated by Citibank. So uh, cover logo by Noah Teplo, JCAS student age 17. 100 chefs for JCAS. Welcome to the Junior Center of Art and Sciences Spring Fundraising Event. We are proud to offer you a mouth-watering selection of hors d'oeuvres, salads, entrees, and desserts for your selection and enjoyment. Each dish has been prepared, donated, and presented by a friend of the Junior Center. Many of our chefs, ha chefs have also shared their recipes in the pages to follow. <laughs> um, the children's artwork displayed in the entry was created by JCAS students ages 5 to 16. We hope you will take the time to look at their work. Center students and faculty are also available to paint faces of all ages. Face painting is included in the price of a child or family ticket. Adults are encouraged to join the festivities and have their faces painted for $1 contribution. Proceeds from this event benefit the Center Scholarship Fund. We are proud to report that every qualified scholarship applicant has reserved funding to attend JCAS programs. And so uh, you should be able to see on the screen um, the ink that has transferred here at the bottom. So this, to me, it, it looks like it was done on an inkjet printer. Um, and we've had the ink transfer here on the front. And that's just from it transferring off of this page onto another piece of paper and then back onto this page. Um, and here, just where the pages are touching each other, the ink has transferred. This ink is um, kind of like a gel or liquidy type ink. And over time, if it's not kept in perfect like uh, temperature and humidity conditions, um, the ink can absorb moisture again or um, with the application of some heat. So if this was stored in somebody's attic for some time or in a room that got warm, um, the ink can become kind of sticky and tacky again and then transfer. So there are a number of places in here where that has happened. Um, and likely that happened before it came to our collections. Because um, we do, in the archives, we store things in a space that is temperature and humidity controlled um, in order to prevent these kinds of deterioration. So the Junior Center of Art and Science. Founded in 1954, its continued mission is to provide early education in the arts and sciences to the children of Oakland and the East Bay. Programs include educational exhibits, workshops and classes taught on school sites designed for students and classroom teachers, and specialized courses presented at the center after school, weekends, and in the summer. And the center currently serves over 9,000 children annually. Um, again, this is 1993. The chefs here, I'm looking to see if Gary Giovanni is listed. And here, yep, we have uh, Gary Giovanni and Yolanda Giovanni. And Gary Giovanni was providing the Midwestern Smoky Brisket. So 
So I'm gonna look and see if there is a recipe in here for the Midwestern Smoky Brisket. It does not appear that there is a recipe for that dish in here. But also, if you look here on the back interior of the cover, we have the Junior Center of Art and Science Board of Trustees, who the vice president was Gary Giovanni. I'm trying to catch up here on, uh, on chat here. Um, laser printers were also big in the 90s. It's true, it's possible it was a, a laser printer and not an inkjet. Um, yeah, yeah, checking for counterfeit money, that ink transfer is definitely one of the things uh, back then that would have been used. Hi, Elaki. Welcome to, uh, welcome to Archival Adventures. Um, yeah, so Elaki, the uh, past episodes of Archival Adventures are available on the Virginia Tech University Library's YouTube site. Um, I will find that link for you here real quick. Unless, Alice, can you find the link for the, um, the past episodes playlist for Archival Adventures and drop it in the chat on Rogan27? Instead of me taking the time to do it, I'll just ask my mods to do it. <laughs> Actually, you can drop it in both chats. That'd be lovely. Picado, thank you for stopping by. Um, it was lovely having you here, and I hope to see you again in the future. Let's see. Here we have um, professional activities, culinary, catering. Catering business sample menus. So these are going to be sample menus from Gary Giovanni's catering business. I'm going to pull the contents of the folder and move the folder to the side. Um, and Alice, for the future, can uh, you just make a note that I would, it'd be nice to have a small table <laughs> near here. I'm struggling a little with uh, keeping the things in order when I pull them out of the folder. Hey, hey Kira got the, the link uh, to the past episode playlist onto the um, VTUL Studios site. And Alice, I see that you got it on uh, the other channel. Elaki, you're part of a physical RPG library, and we need to learn lots about preservation and archiving. So much to learn. Well, Elaki, you are welcome to get in touch uh, with me if you want a consultation. Um, part of my role as the community collections archivist here at Virginia Tech is providing um, just general consultation on archival procedures and processes to community groups. So if you're interested, um, you're welcome to get in touch. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure yet, uh, Tony. We'll look at the document in one second here. Um, for some reason, Mubot is being very, very bad and blocked Kira from posting a link. <laughs> I think it's because you're in the wrong account to be have the link posting permissions, Kira. <laughs> uh, Alice got it on the other channel, Kira. Um, what I was going to say is if one of you two could post the link to the um, consultation booking on the library's website uh, for eLackey, that would be lovely. because uh, Elaki, you're welcome to book a consultation with me and I'm happy to talk with you about um, approaching whatever archival needs that your organization has. Let's 
so this appears to be, let's see, we have a note about a voicemail. Niswa's swordfish salad in ondi ondive cups. I can't read the next line. Uh, consider chicken. Let's see, olives and nuts. I'm not going to spend all of my time trying to figure out the handwriting. It's one of the interesting things is um, looking at documents and everybody's handwriting is unique and sometimes deciphering it takes a little bit of effort. So this word here, I'm not immediately getting. I would need to look to other spots where I'm able to make things out and see commonalities of the um, uh, formation of the letters and pick it apart letter by letter to figure out what it says because I'm not getting it from context. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so this is a handwritten, um, sketch, it looks like, of a, a recipe, or I mean, not a recipe, of a menu. Oh, wow. Um, so VTUL Alice just noted in chat that our campus is closing tomorrow. Um, we are supposed to be getting sleet and snow, um, and the snow emergency routes go into effect at 5 p.m. here today. Uh, so. I know there are many people out there that are currently dealing with um, some winter weather, especially the people in Texas, the, their state is not really set up to deal with winter weather. Um, so I'm sure it has been particularly difficult there. And I know even down in San Antonio, they were supposed to be getting some freezing rain today. So I hope that if anybody's watching from regions of the country that are getting um, particular winter weather, um, that you're staying safe and warm. Um, oh, I see Archivist Kira managed to post a link um, to our online booking. Uh, Elaki, you're welcome to book an appointment with me. Um, if you go in there for um, special collections help or for community archives help, I believe are the two options that are on there that will get you to my calendar. Um, <laughs> so we have a cocktail party, uh, Provence bean dip. Some kind of maybe clover mousse with toasted hazelnuts. I'm not sure about that word being clover here on the second line. Um, and I can't read the first word. It's the same word that I couldn't read on the first page. Um, smoked salmon rayettes. Uh, gingered, gingered eggplant spread. Fresh tomato salsa. I'm not a cook, so these sound very interesting to me. Some of these things, I, I do like to eat, <laughs> but I don't cook, I bake. <laughs> Give them a satisfaction they couldn't get any uh, way. Pesto deviled eggs, spiced nuts, caviar nachos, Louisiana shrimp, I think. Mushroom leek turnovers. Garlic herb tart, asparagus dill tart, macerated black olives, barbecue, barbecue, I'm not sure what that word is, and chipotle chili mayonnaise. Interesting. So. Um, handwritten, definitely harder to read. Um, some of them are super easy. This just, I'm not familiar enough with uh, her 
character formation in her cursive. Uh, it would take me a little bit of time to work out certain words. Um, and that's not unusual. Um, and actually, this is much easier to read than some of the stuff that we have from the 1800s um, or like the Civil War materials that we have where their cursive slants very much to the left and often there's cross-hatching in how it's written. I'll pull some of those and we'll, we'll look at them sometime. Um, so this isn't really bad, it's just that there are some words that I'm struggling to make out on like seeing them immediately. Um, and I'm sure with that and like the combination of the typed letter or the typed menu here, I could probably figure it out much easier. Also, Kira, more metal. Um, <laughs> assorted hors d'oeuvres, price list and yield, almond stuffed dates, corn cups filled with best chili, fresh crab empanadas, chicken skewers, sausage roll puffs, puff pastry straws, oriental chicken salad tartlets. So the, again, the date range on this, this would have been the 90s. Um, I definitely would expect that today it would not be using the word oriental. <laughs> but um, this is probably early to mid 90s, I would guess. Uh, or I don't know, uh, the, I believe the date range on the materials is 97, but we've definitely had stuff from 93 um, in the box. But still, it's, it's not unusual to see this word. It is definitely one that I would prefer not to use. Um, no metal staples. <laughs> right, right, Tony. Um, cucumber rounds with smoked salmon mousse. Cherry tomato stuffed with artichokes and hearts of hearts of psalm. Um, green chili wonton cups. Shrimp and cheese sui mai. Italian sausage seven mushroom calzette. I guess that's a miniature calzone. Brie and walnut triangles. Polish sausage in puff pastry. Summer squash squares. Cocktail turnovers and empanadas. Uh, baby Dutch Babies. I don't know what that is. Pancetta and Gruyere Tartlets. And Sun-Dried Tomato and Chicken Bites with Basil Mayonnaise. Hopefully uh, you all have more immediate access to food than I do. This is making me somewhat hungry. Um, B-I-G-G, -G, Blacksburg's smallest caterer with big ideas. Becky, I am not artistic, but we could have, if you like the idea, a logo of a tiny chef with a big light bulb. Maybe a chef's hat on the top of the light bulb. Mull it over. Time is on our side to make just the right statement. Oh, Kira, thank you. Dutch Baby is a baked pancake with fruit. I did not know that. I'd never heard of that before. Oh, and here we have <clears throat> more info. Rolls. The word I couldn't read was rolls on the handwritten thing. So we have Niçoise swordfish salad in endive cups, coriander chicken rolls, olives, and nuts. This is the typed up version of what was handwritten. Smoked chicken torte, gingered side of salmon, that makes more sense than what I thought it said in the handwritten version. Asparagus and mushrooms with sesame orange dressing. Romaine radicchio and fennel salad. Wild rice salad. French bread. Fresh lemon roulade and chocolate party cake. So again, if you have looked at the um, finding aid at all and there's anything specific that you would like to see do let me know. Uh, here we have a dinner menu with lamb moogle. <laughs> Rafe Bay. Yeah, um, sorry. It is a culinary collection, so food was definitely going to be the topic. <laughs> Sautéed cherry tomatoes, spinach with chickpeas, pita bread, fresh coconut 
cake with raspberry puree. Asparagus salad jardiniere with mayonnaise au fin herbs. I don't know what a jardiniere is. Jard I also am not saying it with a very good accent, but um, jardiniere. Jard Typing the word into the Google. It is an ornamental pot or stand for the display of growing plants or a garnish of mixed vegetables. So this, this one I assume would be the garnish of mixed vegetables. <laughs> um, deep fried camembert with wild lingonberry preserves. Ooh, that sounds good. Uh, cold smoked chicken breast, ginger shortcake with peaches and cream, asparagus with beurre blanc, Salmon scallops with sorrel sauce, julienne carrots and string beans, risotto, and iced lemon mousse tartlets. Let's see. <laughs> Some recipes in here that appear to have been photocopied from cookbooks, which, why not? Hopefully, uh, somebody bought the cookbook, but um, these are also possibly just like research material. If you're a chef, you would need to read um, lots of cookbooks and get ideas. And I don't know if you can hear, but there's a, a PA... Uh, going off right now, announcing that campus will be closed tomorrow. Uh, asparagus salad, garden salad with mayo and herbs. I think, I think, yeah, that's what that had. Um, I'm distracted now, sorry. So we have repetition of some of these same menus. <coughs> I'm gonna move on and see what's in box two. There are three boxes. Um, there is a folder of stuff about Nikki Giovanni, but as much as Nikki Giovanni is amazing, uh, I think focusing more on her sister, whose collection this is, makes more sense. But if you do want me to pull out the Nikki Giovanni, um, I will do so. Culinary and catering. Pull out, these are gonna be a couple of her catering jobs. Um, it's, so this is a little bit unnerving. <laughs> um, I think it's probably too quiet for you all to hear, but the um, the VT Alerts uh, system is going off right now, advising that campus will be closed tomorrow, and uh, mentioning that the, because of the weather advisory for tomorrow that, that it's going to close. This is extremely unusual uh, for them to have closed it now. Um, <laughs> yeah, I figure you couldn't hear it because I'm using the lav, but it's not usual. Like, usually if they were going to close, they would close, like, overnight sometime. And so for them to be announcing the closure at 3.30 in the afternoon when it's, n it's like sunny outside right now, there's nothing going on, this is really unusual. It makes me wonder how bad the weather service has, has, like how bad the prediction is <laughs> if they're closing campus for tomorrow already. Um, big voice in the sky, yes, yes, Tony. Um, okay, so this folder is a catering job that they had. Um, this was for 
Virginia Tech Women's Studies on September 25th, 1999. Um, and we have a letter here. It appears to have gotten some liquid or other stuff on it, possibly like egg white that got on here. I'm not sure. Predicted five to eight inches of snow with some ice at the end. That has definitely changed since the last time I looked. Wow. Um, so we have a letter here uh, from July 28th, 1999 to Dr. Laura Gorfinkel, uh, Director of Women's Studies, CIS. Alice or Kira, do either of you remember what CIS would stand for as a organization at Tech? Ray Fay, it's supposed to be mostly ice where you're at. Um, Dear Laura, thank you for the opportunity of presenting a sample menu for the Women's Studies Luncheon on December 25, 1999 at Elizabeth Kramer's home. Computer and information systems? Yeah, that doesn't seem right. This is, it seems like CIS would be referring to the area that women's studies sits within, but I also know women's studies is weird and pulls in professors from various places across campus. Oh, the entire storm no, south of DC and north up through New York from, yeah. Um, originally, when I looked at it last night, it looked like we weren't supposed to get any snow here at all. It was all supposed to be north of us and it was supposed to be all ice here. Um, so to have them change it and say that we're supposed to get a bunch of snow with ice at the end um, definitely increases uh, the danger of the storm. Uh, sample menu for Women's Studies Luncheon. Elizabeth Kramer's home. Uh, I offer the following. Gruyere onion tart, green salad, and in... Uh, the handwritten note there next to it is romaine. Hot sweet coleslaw, Waldorf chicken salad or chicken tonnado. Pasta, pasta primavera or pasta with pesto sauce. And the or pasta with pesto sauce has been crossed out. So I assume um, the notes that were taken here were after discussion with uh, Dr. Gorfinkel. Blue cheese popovers, fresh raspberry cheesecake, blueberry lemon bars, lemonade, mint tea, and coffee. One of the desserts can be used for your afternoon break. This menu is based on approximately 30 people and the cost will be $15 per person. I look forward to hearing from you. Sincerely, Gary Giovanni. Yeah, uh, Rafe, that forecast that you list there for Annapolis is very similar to what they're for forecasting here in Southwest Virginia where we're at. Uh, so we have a, a handwritten recipe here for the popovers. One cup of milk, two eggs, which has been crossed out. So I don't know if that is meant to be an underline or a cross out of the eggs. One and, qu one, and one quarter ounces of blue cheese. Uh, the salad, four large oranges, red wine vinegar, which again, it could either be crossed out or underlined. Limes, avocado, lemons, and lettuce. And then they have chic salad, which I believe is meant to be chicken salad, but it is abbreviated C-H-I-C, and it's just fun to call it chic salad. Uh, 16 skinless boneless breasts, about uh, six It's crossed out. I'm guessing that maybe this was used as like a shopping list. And that the items that are crossed out have already been, were crossed out as they were being uh, picked up. Four cups of walnuts, three cups mayo and yogurt, four tart apples, celery, onion, and carrot. And then the lemonade, mint tea, and coffee cream sugar are listed on there. Um, ooh, there's another side to it. Uh, Again, this appears to be a shopping list for everything that was needed to make the dishes for the women's studies luncheon. 
Need to serve that salad on a fancy tray. Tray chic. That is a very good uh, speak attack there, key squared. Uh, a nice little pun. <laughs> I can't read it very well, um, so I'm just going to skip on to other things that I can read. Let's see. Referral, Stacy Lloyd Thomas, September 25th, Elizabeth Kramer's house. I'm going to move that to the side because I don't really want that address on screen. Ooh, recipes, blue cheese popovers. Center for Interdisciplinary Studies, key squared, thank you. <laughs> Way to go in finding that. That's very helpful. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to know that that's what that was. Orangitis, I see you, welcome. Welcome back, I guess. Um, we are doing a program called Archival Adventures that I do on Wednesdays. Um, this is me looking at items from the Gary Ann Giovanni, the Gary Ann Giovanni Culinary Papers um, from the Archives of Virginia Tech Special Collections and University Archives. Uh, blue cheese popovers, a recipe from this luncheon. Uh, two large eggs, one cup of milk, one, or sorry, two tablespoons unsalted butter, melted, plus more for the tins, one cup all-purpose flour, one half teaspoon kosher salt, one eighth teaspoon freshly ground black pepper, one and one quarter ounces blue cheese crumbled, one tablespoon roughly chopped fresh thyme. In a large bowl, whisk together the eggs, milk, melted butter, flour, salt, and pepper. Whisk until all of the lumps have disappeared. Whisk in the cheese and the thyme. Transfer the batter to an airtight container. The batter must be chilled. Refrigerate for at least two hours or up to one day. Preheat the oven to 425. Generously butter the mini muffin tins. Fill each cup to the top with the chilled batter. Bake the popovers until golden and puffed. 15 to 18 minutes. Repeat until all the batter is used. Serve warm, and that serves Four dozen people. Um, incidentally, we do have a rather large um, culinary collection here. It is one of our collecting area focuses. And if we were to do any sort of like cooking program, would people be interested in that? Um, we haven't really discussed it, but it's definitely a category that people stream on Twitch is cooking. And so if we were to, there, there'd be a lot of logistics to work out. It's not something that we would start right away um, if we did something like that. But if we were to pull out like old recipes and try cooking them on air, would people be interested? Romaine tomato and avocado salad with cornbread croutons with creamy chipotle vinaigrette. <laughs> there are some definite yeses. Uh, Simsilica, hi. Um, but uh, yes, so it seems like there's definite interest for that. And we will um, we'll have to look into that. It seems like something that would fit really well with what we're doing. Especially if it could get into the historical context of the recipes and interesting documentation issues. Yeah. Um, that's certainly a possibility. Um, I don't know yet what facilities we would have available for doing it. Um, don't make you doodle food for me. <laughs> You'll do it. Because <laughs> um, we don't presently have a kitchen in the library. Um, so figuring out the logistics of where it would happen and how we would get the cameras set up and, and all of that, um, there's some work that would need to go into building it, but it's good to know that people would have interest if we decided that we want to do that. Um, 
I'm going to skip the salad. Let's look at this hot sweet coleslaw with caramelized almonds. Because I'm curious about hot sweet. Uh, so first, caramelized almonds, two tablespoons of sugar, two tablespoons of water, three quarters of a cup of blanched almonds, and one teaspoon coarse salt or more to taste. Hot sweet mayonnaise, three quarters cup low fat store bought or homemade mayonnaise, one quarter cup sour cream or yogurt, one teaspoon of honey, and three quarters of a teaspoon of cayenne pepper. And then for the coleslaw, we of course have vegetables. Uh, one cup cored and thinly sliced green cabbage. One cup cored and thinly sliced red cabbage. Two tablespoons finely minced onion or shallot. Two tablespoons peeled and julienned jicama. Mmm, jicama. One cup of grated carrot. One cup of thinly sliced fennel, preferably sliced on a mandolin. Uh, to caramelize the almonds, combine the sugar and water in a medium skillet and cook over medium heat until the mixture begins to bubble and brown slightly. About three minutes. Do not stir, but swirl the pan by the handle. Add the almonds and toss to coat. Immediately, remove the nuts from the skillet and spread them to cool on a cookie sheet lined with foil. Sprinkle with coarse salt. You can do this ahead of time. Stored in an airtight container, the nuts will keep for several weeks. In a small bowl, blend all the ingredients for the mayonnaise in the order listed. In a large mixing bowl, I love that direction. Instead of like, um, do this, blend this, 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 and this, it's just blend them in the order listed. And you refer back to above and they're listed in a certain order. I love that direction. Um, yeah, key squared, we can talk about the mandolin in just a second. I'm gonna finish reading the recipe first. In a large mixing bowl, combine the prepared vegetables and the mayonnaise. Cover and allow to rest in the refrigerator for at least 30 minutes. Fold in the almonds just before serving. It serves six. So if you're not familiar with a mandolin, um, you are correct that it is a slicer. We'll pull up an image, if I can, of one in use. And I will throw this over to the screen share screen. Possibly. Yes, there. So that is a mandolin, the tool that the, the person in that image is using. It has a blade that is very, very sharp. And this is like a consumer grade, consumer sized uh, mandolin. So this is actually from Ikea's website because um, it's the first picture that came up that had a person using one. Um, and you can set it to different depths. So there, in the picture, you can even see there are different um, the slices of cucumber there are different widths because um, you can adjust the mandolin to do really fine slices or thicker slices. Um, you like thinking that someone dropped a piece of fruit, fruit on their instrument mid-string and went, oh! Um, the mandolin for me is the most terrifying piece of kitchen equipment that exists. Uh, whenever someone is using the mandolin on a television show, um, I cringe. I can't watch. I can't because they are so sharp. Um, and it would be very easy for them to hurt themselves using it, and I just can't watch. Uh, but yeah, that's what a mandolin is. <laughs> um... We have a recipe here for pasta primavera, Waldorf chicken salad. Uh, clearly this recipe was used in the preparation of food. It has been, um, it has some little bits of food still on it and some water has gotten on it. Um, that is what my cookbooks look like when I, I have a pie baking book that I showed actually the other day on my personal stream. Um, and it has warped pages like that because uh, so much water has gotten on that cookbook as I've had it there on the counter while I was preparing things. Ooh, fresh raspberry cheesecake. Let's look at this one. 
<laughs> um, heat the oven to 325. So this, uh, for anyone who's not in the United States, this would be 325 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, this recipe being for use in an American kitchen. Um, so heat the oven to 325, roll one half pint raspberries, rinse and pat a pat, mixture of tenses here. Uh, half pint raspberries, rinse, patted dry in two tablespoons sugar or enough to coat. Coat the bottom and sides of a nine inch spring form pan with one tablespoon unsalted butter. Sprinkle with one quarter cup graham cracker crumbs. So I know what a spring form pan is. Um, if you're not familiar with it, a spring form, basically just, you've got a disc of metal and then you've got a wall of metal that goes around it and that wall of metal has a little clasp that will pull it tight and closed. Um, and after you make something in that pan and it's had a chance to cool, you can undo that latch and the rim around the side will open up. It'll spring open a little bit and you can take that out and then remove it. So yeah, they're wonderful for cakes. This is a cheesecake and a springform pan is absolutely the right pan to make it in. Hi, librarian Claire, welcome. Um, are springform pans used for anything other than cheesecake? I don't actually know. I, I know they're used for cheesecake. Kira is much more of a cook than I am and might know for sure. Um, but I can also, let me look up springform pans. I'm just curious enough. That's a really great question. And I am not an experienced chef by any means. You made a key lime pie in once in one. Springform pan is a type of bakeware that, this, so this is straight from w Wikipedia, um, but Wikipedia is great for like a general primer on a topic. Uh, a springform pan is a type of bakeware that features sides that can be removed from the base. Springform refers to the construction style. The base and sides are separate pieces that are held together when the base is aligned with a groove that rings the bottom of the walls. The pan is then secured by a latch on the exterior of the wall. This tightens the belt that becomes the walls of the pan and secures the base into the groove at the base of the walls. Um, it doesn't, oh, here we go. Springform pans, it's used to bake dishes that cannot be easily inverted for removal from the pan. Some of the most common recipes to call for springform pans are cheesecakes and torts. Springform pans, however, are also useful in the preparation of pizzas, quiches, and frozen, frozen desserts. So basically anything that you want to be able to remove from the pan without turning it upside down is what you would use a springform pan for. I'm going to take one second and back away from the materials to get a sip of water. You'd get a really nice pan pizza, Claire. <laughs> I, I have not done it in a spring form either because I don't own a spring form, but now I wish I did. You could easily do like a Chicago deep dish in a spring form pan. Um, where, let's see. We managed to get through the fruit. <laughs> Uh, coat the bottom and sides of a nine inch spring form pan with, a one table, with one tablespoon of unsalted butter. Sprinkle with one quarter cup of graham cracker crumbs. Tilt and tap the pan to spread the crumbs easily over, evenly over the bottom and sides. In a large bowl, beat just until smooth, 30 to 60 seconds, two pounds of cream cheese. Scrape the sides of the bowl and beaters well. Gradually add and beat until smooth and creamy. One to two minutes. One and one third cups of sugar. Ooh, Wraith Faye, that's a great idea, making a lasagna in a springform pan. Um, and then you beat one at a time, just until blended, scraping the sides of the bowl and beaters after each addition, four eggs. So this is a very interesting way to write a recipe. It gives the instruction and then tells you the ingredient to use that on, which is 
the opposite of how most recipes work. But again, this was a personal recipe that was prepared by Gary Giovanni for use in her catering business. So if this was more useful for her, um, it makes perfect sense to, to write it out this way. It's just very interesting to read it when you're encountering the recipe for the first time because we're used to seeing in cookbooks where you get a list of ingredients with their measures and then instructions on what to do with them. And in this case, we're getting the instruction followed by an ingredient and its measure. Um, and so it tells us what to do with it and then what and how much of as far as an ingredient. It's, it's like flipping it. <laughs> Orangitis cooking streams. I think this means you're an official variety streamer now. Um, this isn't technically a cooking stream, although if I had a kitchen that could do it, I definitely would do cooking streams. Um, so we add more ingredients. Scrape three quarters of batter into pan and smooth top. Sprinkle sugared berries over top. Scrape in remaining batter and smooth top. Wrap pan on counter to eliminate air bubbles. Set pan on length of wide, heavy-duty foil. Fold foil carefully up sides of pan. Boiling water, wait. Set pan in large baking dish or roasting pan. Set baking dish in oven and pour in enough boiling water to reach halfway up the sides of the cheesecake pan. Bake until the edges of the cheesecake look set, but center jiggles slightly when the pan is tapped. 55 to 60 minutes. Turn, turn off oven, prop door ajar with handle of wooden spoon, and let cake cool in oven for one hour. Remove to rack and let cool completely in pan before unmolding. Cover and refrigerate for at least six hours, preferable 24 before serving. And then the topping on this for the fresh raspberry cheesecake is one cup of sour cream with one half to one pint of raspberries. And this is 12 to 16 servings. So this, again, this was all material from the luncheon that Gary Giovanni was working on for the 1999 uh, Women's Studies Luncheon on September 25th, 1999. I pulled another of these um, catering files here. Um, this is uh, Professional Activities Culinary, the Open University. of. Uh, this was the YMCA cooking program that she was involved in. Uh, tarts from Sweet to Savory, April 1st, 1998. <clears throat> so let's see what we have here. I'm going to kind of just glance through because I don't want addresses to go out on stream. If there's any letters addressed to specific people, I want to be able to cover those up. Looks like we're good. <clears throat> So, this is the Young Men's Christian Association of VPI and SU Incorporated, which is the YMCA of Virginia Tech. Um, one of the oldest campus organizations, actually. Uh, so, they had the bill was $129.75. And we have a letter here from the Virginia Tech YMCA from April 20th, no year. Again, this is a letter, no year. This isn't even a, an advertisement for an event. <laughs> um, sorry. Earlier today, we, were we, we mentioned um, a little frustration with items that do not include a year. Dear Gary, Thanks so much for teaching. Here, I might be able to zoom in a little bit on this letter here so that you can read along with me. Dear Gary, thanks so much for teaching for the Open University this spring session. I hope you had a fun class. Please know how much I appreciate your dedication and interest to the why. I will be sending the 1998-99 schedule to you by June. 
I hope you will be interested in teaching again this again next year. If you have any suggestions for any way that we can help with your class or the operation of the Open University, please let me know. Again, thanks for all you do. Sincerely, Marge Bond. Uh, so based on that, this is April probably of 1998. Um, because I believe that they are going to be operating on school, school year um, calendar, so the 98-99 schedule would be fall of 98, spring of 99. So this letter sent in April, probably April of 1998, but we don't know for sure because it doesn't say. And then there's this handwritten note, you are you are receiving such great reviews. Thanks for all you do. So that is lovely. Um, we have a session evaluation for the session Tarts from Savory to Sweet 101. Uh, the session was on April 1st, 1998, given by Gary Giovanni. And you can see here, the person who filled out this evaluation selected excellent for every question. They just circled the four all the way up and down. Uh, list suggestions for future classes on subjects in which you would be interested. Uh, Mexican vegetables, elegant cakes, soup, hot and cold, food processor class, cakes, beef, spicy foods, low calorie cooking, um, other comments and suggestions for improvement of this presentation. More basic instruction. So it seems like maybe it was a little bit too advanced for this person. A whole class on food processors. That is what this feedback is asking for. So I don't know if that ever became a thing, uh, but it, it does seem that that is what is being requested. Um, Replace, I can't read the, the note on the post-it. I would have to stare at it for a while to figure out what it says. Yeah, that handwriting looks familiar. That's Gary Giovanni's handwriting, which unfortunately is one that I can't immediately read upon seeing it. it I have to work it out a little bit, um, which I didn't know until I opened this collection. Sometimes you see somebody's handwriting and you get it right away, and it's great, and you just flow. I had a letter from a Civil War soldier that was um, quite lengthy, and I just looked at it, and I was just able to just read straight through it with no problems. And then I get something like this, and I look at it, and I just struggle to figure out what it says. Um, yeah, that does look like garlic, but I don't know what the word before it is, before the slash. bulb? I, d I don't know what it is. Um, I have, it would also help if I was more knowledgeable about the subject matter of cooking. Like I can make out some of it and I recognize words and can read them and pronounce them correctly. Um, it could be her, it could be herb or herb. Or oh, the handwriting in the comments. I don't know whose handwriting is in the comments. But uh, let's see. So the class list here, we've got a number of people <laughs> um, who attended. I don't need to linger on that for too long. I'm not terribly worried, but I don't want to keep addresses up there forever either. Uh, the comments look like half the girls from your high school. So Orangitis asked a question over on the other channel. What specifically is savory? If it's a basic flavor, I'm not sure I can even taste it, let alone pinpoint what flavor it actually is. People give me examples of it, but nothing about the foods have a common flavor to me. Maybe I just can't taste it for some reason. So it's a category and not like a specific flavor. So savory, um, 
generally gets juxtaposed or, or uh, opposed to sweet. So a savory dish is going to be um, more salty, more more seasoned. Um, so something like a chicken, uh, a, like a chicken pot pie would be a savory pie, whereas an apple pie is a sweet pie. Um, they're both pies, but one has herbs and salt and it, that category of flavors to it. And the other is more emphasizing the spices and the sweetness. Um, that's, I guess, how I would describe the difference between savory and other flavor categories. Um, as far as like American discussion of palate and, and flavors and, and things like that, we tend to talk about sweet and savory and bitter and sour. Um, and then more recently, we've added in the category of umami um, as a different approach to flavor and, and a different aspect of how you experience food. Um, but yeah, if anybody else has an explanation of what savory is, uh, feel free to drop that in chat. Um, I see Adventures of Tony said more salty than sweet. Um, yeah, I, I, I would agree with Tony, like salty and seasoned and things like that. Um, So here we have tarts from savory to sweet. Uh, come to a dinner and dessert class. Try and try and read this while I'm on camera here and not, not shift out of the camera to get too close to it. I also have the words on a screen in front of me thanks to the uh, camera here. Come to a dinner and dessert class. Join, join, I'm take it away for a second here. Oh wow, those are G's. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. Um, I have not seen G's written that way before, but join Gary Giovanni for a demonstration and hands-on class in the art of tart making. We'll discuss Pate, which is crossed out. We'll discuss the differences between pate brise and pate sucre. Sucre. And when each is used, we'll then make filling for savory tarts, which may include asparagus and asparagus and duck tart, and gruyere and prosciutto. I can't make out that word, bar. B-A-R-G. Bagatelles? Bar I'm not sure what that word is. Um. <laughs> Uh, while they bake, we'll make our dessert, which may include a sugar tart, tart to tan, or strawberry and lemon curd tart. I think I did pretty good, considering that I struggle with her hand or with, with some of these handwritings. I don't know for sure that this is Gary's handwriting. <laughs> Pâté brisé and pâté sucré are types of pie crust. Alice, thank you for that. I was not familiar with those terms. Um, oh, here we have a, an advertisement for, so this is not, I guess, this is the catalog of courses. And here on the back we have Number 37, Chinese cooking. Get out your chopsticks and join Gary Giovanni for a tour through mainland China. Learn the proper way to cook rice, to make Chinese stock, and to prepare and cut chicken. 
We will make a Chinese dinner which will include honey chili chicken, fried rice, chow vegetables, and more. As we cook, we'll discuss the different regions of China and their popular dishes. Um, I cringed a little bit at the get out your chopsticks, but uh, overall that wasn't too bad. Um, and chopsticks are a very good instrument for eating, <laughs> especially Chinese cuisine. So anyway, here we have a, uh, Oh, this appears to be the what was handwritten, but typed up and sent via email. Come to a dinner and dessert class. Join, Jerry, join Gary Giovanni for a demonstration and hands-on class in the art of tart making. We'll discuss the differences between pâté brisé and pâté sucré and when each type of pastry is used. We'll then make filling for savory tarts, which may include asparagus, dill tart, and gruyere. Prosciutti barquettes. That's the word I couldn't get before. While they bake, uh, we'll make our dessert, which may include a sugar tart, tart to tan, or strawberry and lemon curd tart. So, brise is a standard, somewhat flaky crust, and sucre has sugar and is more of a short crust. Interesting. So I personally find these very interesting, partly because I like to bake and I've only made a couple of tarts. And so seeing this stuff, we have a basic pie pastry recipe here uh, with directions for doing it by hand or using a food processor. Um, wild mushroom tart sounds so good. I also happen to really like mushrooms. <laughs> this is using dried porcini mushrooms, as well as cremini, uh, or button mushrooms. Some Gruyere cheese. Ooh, it sounds delicious. Herbed goat cheese tart. So these are the different tarts that they were looking at in this class. So, um, Orangitis, for your question about savory versus sweet, uh, the wild mushroom here would definitely be a savory tart. This is gonna be more earthy flavors. This is, I would say, if it was described today, it would probably be referred to as umami um, because those kind of earthy uh, notes would classify it more umami than savory. But um, yeah, so this has got lots of herbs and um, like meaty flavors to it. Uh, the herbed goat cheese is also going to be a savory tart. It could easily go into sweet if we were to add fruit and stuff like that, but this is um, really just herbs and, and the cheese, and so the cheese is more of a savory. Asparagus and dill is another savory, because um, again, this is vegetables and cheese and it's going to be more on the salty side of the spectrum than the sweet side of the spectrum. Onion tart could go either way. Um, onions are particularly sweet, but they tend to be classified more towards the savory. And here we're specifically using savory tart crust. Gruyere and prosciutto barquettes. Again, this is going to be, um, prosciutto is like a ham product, and then there's cheese. So this will be a savory. Fresh herb and garlic tart. Uh, again, garlic, herbs, hitting on all of those savory notes. But then we get into the sweets. So free form apple tart. So apple is going to be sugar. Uh, it's the three tablespoons of sugar added to this along with the natural sugars that are in the apples. Um, and apricot glaze. Uh, so lots of sweet to this. Strawberry and lemon curd is going to be a sweet rather than a savory. Uh, sugar tart, unsurprisingly, a sweet tart. But not a sweet tart, like the candies. 
<laughs> uh, currant glaze, apricot glaze. These glazes, um, if you're not familiar with pastry, uh, with like pie making and tart making and things like that, oftentimes you do the crust first and then you brush it with a glaze that's oftentimes an apricot glaze. Um, and that seals the crust so that when you pour in the filling, it doesn't seep through into the crust and have you end up with like soggy crust. Um, so these are important tools for like baking and, and doing fruit, uh, fruit baking, especially fruit pies and things like that. Um, <laughs> sweet tarts are good. <laughs> um, and then we've got a recipe for tart pastry. Uh, the pâté brisé and pâté sucré, roasted bell pepper and onion tart. See, when I think tart, I immediately go sweet, but there are so many options. Um, and honestly, a pepper tart, this, this is using red and yellow bell peppers, it could go sweet. You could do a dessert tart that is red and yellow bell peppers. This appears, it's got basil, um, it doesn't have sugar added, so this is definitely meant to be a savory one. Um, but you could easily do a dessert with peppers. No soggy bottoms, right, Tony? Uh, nectarine and plum tartlets. So again, those are gonna be sweet. Peach tart is gonna be sweet. Honey peach tart with vanilla ice cream. Again, sweet. Um, that sounds like an amazing class and one that I definitely would have enjoyed taking had I been here back then. Uh, again, this was the end of the 1990s. Um, well, we have a little bit of time left. No foggy bottoms either. It's only allowed at GWU, not VTU. Uh, that is a very geographical joke, key squared. <laughs> um, for anyone who's not familiar with the Washington, D.C. area, there is an area um, in the metro called Foggy Bottom that is around where George Washington University is. Um, there's actually one of the D.C. metro uh, stops is called Foggy Bottom. Um, <laughs> so that was both a pun and a geographic joke. Uh, let's see, Mediterranean cooking, outdoor entertaining, French cooking, Halloween party. These are more of these classes, more Mexican soups, Chinese cooking, holiday hors d'oeuvres, breakfast, any time of the day. That one sounds interesting. Dinner party. Dinner at the Greenbrier, New Orleans Mardi Gras. Oh, no, we have to do this one, sorry. Breakfast any time of the day sounds interesting, but we only really have time for one more. And there's one here called New Orleans Mardi Gras party. And since yesterday was Mardi Gras, we have to look at this one. Hey, Simsilica, thank you for that information. Savory foods contain amino acids, usually glutamates. I did not know this. All right, so this starts off with a lot of li little scraps of paper in here. Um, To be, I do not know what that last word is there. It's like P-H-E-A-D or something like that. Fascinating or fascinating. Okay, <laughs> sorry, I thought you were adding more jokes there, Orangitis. Um, Creole seasoning, barbecue sauce, make mayo, and get bread for pudding. So it's like to-do list, of course. Um, grocery list for two classes. Chicken breast. And 
I mean, these are interesting as grocery lists, but also they're mostly only interesting to do ahead. Thank you, Key Squared. I couldn't read it, and um, I'm glad that you could. Uh, the grocery lists are interesting in the context of the recipes, so just looking at them now without having seen the recipes, not as interesting. Uh, let's see, I have the Winter 2002 courses from the Open University at the YMCA at Virginia Tech. Um, I'm zoomed in a bit. I can zoom out a little bit here. So this is from 2002, apparently. See if I can find the listing for this class. Indoor plants, astrology, playing with poetry, books for children, Islam, animal tracking. Food, music, and language. Breakfast breads, prepare a perfect tea party, and New Orleans Mardi Gras party. Um, let's see how best I can get it there without adding extra creases to this. So I will zoom in now that I found it. So potentially useful to future culinary researchers knowing what's prepped ahead versus made just in time. A nice example of why we save these weird little scraps. Exactly, key squared. That is um, a great analysis of why even that little scrap would be useful. So I, as an archivist who really doesn't know much about cooking, that scrap of paper to me looks like a scrap of paper with a little bit of writing on it. And but we don't get rid of things like that. We keep them with the file because some researcher may have a use for them that we haven't thought of. And that's exactly a great example of it. I never would have thought of that use uh, personally. So here we have uh, a New Orleans Mardi Gras party. Kick it up a notch with Gary Giovanni for a celebration menu of small dishes, New Orleans style. Menu offering sweet barbecue sauce, ham and cheese bites, hot jalapeno crab dip, shrimp toast, caramelized salmon with new potatoes, peanut butter cream pie, and banana chocolate bread pudding. So this was on Thursday, February 21st of 2002. Uh, the class was given at Blacksburg High School and cost $14 plus the cost of supplies. Um, do, 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 do. So we have a list for class that again has been checked off or crossed off as, as things have been prepared. There's also a list of equipment, which would be very useful for somebody who was trying to recreate this. You're no food expert, but you have a friend who's a domestic labor historian who gets frustrated when only the public menus are and for events are saved that doesn't tell them who did the work and what they did just about the final delivery and presentation yeah so having like this is a collection from a, an amateur chef who then created her own catering company and taught classes um, and so these are her personal papers as a chef and she would have been developing recipes for the catering business as well as um, working out the logistics of how to present these recipes in the classes that she was teaching. And so having those behind the scenes personal notes, while to me, who's not a cook, they don't mean a lot. Um, as an archivist, there's value in this and we know there's value in this. And so we save it and make it available. Um, and so yeah, as somebody who is a domestic labor historian, um, might find significant value in those additional side notes that to me don't seem like they could be useful. Um, but that's because I don't have the necessary context for understanding um, what use they might have. We have a New Orleans Mardi Gras party order of work. So group A is a chicken and andouille strudel with sweet barbecue sauce, shrimp toast, and peanut butter cream pie. 
uh, mise en place pie crust, bake crust, mise en place pie filling, finish pie, mise en place strudel filling, put strudel together, mise en place shrimp toast, cook toasts. So if you're unfamiliar with the term mise en place, uh, mise en place basically just means you get all of your ingredients ready ahead of time and you've got them there ready to go. So generally this involves a lot of little bowls and dishes. Um, if you've got vegetables that need chopping, you've pre-chopped them and they're sitting there in a bowl. If pre-measured things and it's, it's there ready to go so that as you're cooking you'll just take Oh, it's time to add the red peppers. You grab the bowl of red peppers and just dump them in because they're pre-measured, they're pre-cut, they're ready to go. Um, it takes additional time to do mise en place, but it means that you've got the items ready to go when you need them in the recipe, which sometimes is necessary for the specific timing of preparing a certain dish. Um, I do <laughs> very extensive mise en place whenever I'm baking at home. Um, because otherwise I will miss something and it won't be ready to go when I need it when I'm cooking. Um, so it's the order of work here where, they're, where they've got all these dishes to make, they're doing the mise en place for one and then doing the one, and then doing the mise en place and then doing that, the next one. Um, that's very interesting to me. But we will end. I will throw up, here's the Mardi Gras party menu. This again was a class that was offered through the Open University at the Virginia Tech um, YMCA in 2002 uh, and led by Gary Ann Giovanni. We of course have these materials, they are open for the public to use. Um, through the Virginia Tech University Library's Special Collections and University Archives. Um, our website is uh, spec.lib.vt.edu. Um, if, if the mods wouldn't mind dropping that into the chats, that would be wonderful. Um, information is available on the website about how you can visit the archives if you have any desire to see any of these items for yourself. Uh, we are currently open by appointment only Monday through Thursday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., um, but all of the materials that we have are available just for general use by the public. Uh, items can only be used on site, though, because um, they are part of our archival collections and, and we um, want to preserve them. So they are not for checkout, uh, but it was lovely having you all stop by today. I will be um, setting up a raid, uh, I believe. Let me see who we might want to raid. Um, I think I'm going to send you over to the North Carolina State University Libraries. Right now they are doing a just chatting stream, it looks like. Um, and so that is where we will head today as part of our um, our educational journey. I'm gonna set up that raid on both channels here. Uh, if I can type correctly. Uh, I would very much appreciate it if you stuck around for the raid. Oh, I can't do the raid on my channel because they are not following me. Um, but if you would not mind going over to Twitch dot tv slash ncsu libraries if you're following along on rogan 27 we will raid them from the vtul studios channel thank you all for coming to archival adventures today next week we will be um, exploring our online uh, virginia tech black history timeline um, so it'll be a little bit different we won't have as much as uh, physical materials i will um, if I'm able to get in the building on Friday, I will pull some physical items for things that are on the timeline, but otherwise we will just look at the timeline um, that is available online and we will explore that together. Um, again, thank you all for stopping by and I hope to see you again in the future. So that is going to be the end and I hope you stick around for the raid. I will see you all later. Thank you.